Hey, hey, everyone. It is Sleepy Reader, aka Damien, and I'm here with For the Love of Comics, aka Anshuman. <laughs> Great to be here. I am so excited that you're that we were both able to get our schedules together. Finally, to, yes, we've yeah. been trying for a while. And today we're going to, at least in part, talk about uh, our evolution as readers from tiny little readers to the big old readers we are now. <laughs> Probably mostly as comic book readers, but I'm also, uh, I think it's interesting other stuff, you know, that, that one has read throughout one's uh, lifetime. I have a feeling that we have intersected not only in comics, but maybe in science fiction and fantasy reading also. <laughs> and uh, I do want another uh, little caveat I want to say is um, for those who don't know, actually, uh, For Love of the Comics has a fantastic channel that always emphasizes the positive, as far as I can ever remember on any of your videos. And uh, he takes deep dives. I, I think of your your some of your uh, recorded videos as almost like a, a really rich magazine article where you really look at all the aspects of something and um, and it, they feel very um, shaped and edited like an like a really well written magazine article. Um, Thank you. <laughs> that's um, very that's one way to review them. But um, obviously they're audio visual, not written. So uh, it's more complicated than doing a magazine article. <laughs> And uh, and Anshuman is in India, and I am in uh, the United States. And uh, you probably know a lot more about the United States than I know about India, because we don't get much. Uh, we I've I've seen monsoon wedding. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear! And uh, I've had friends who tell me, "Oh, it's a really long plane ride to India," and a few other things. But um, so if I if I seem ignorant, uh, I apologize. Um, now, you both get all kinds of much more media from the United States, I presume, and you have relatives living in the United States. So um, you, the US is probably, anyway, a lot more familiar to you. Do you feel, do you feel that like? Yes, that absolutely. Difference I mean, culturally that it goes one way. I think so. And I think it's absolutely about the media, you know, depending on your age, uh, you've grown up in a particular way. And I think for some people, you've been saturated with, uh, you know, what is called Western media or over here. And also you've gravitated towards certain kinds of media. It's not always just a, but, but yes, the United States produces a lot of entertainment and right. I like entertainment and a lot of people I know like entertainment, they produce a lot of um, very popular things that travel very well. I mean, of course, there's there's a lot that's produced that's extremely nuanced and detailed and off of certain place, but from the things, you know, that cross borders, there are certain things that the United States does as popular entertainment and manufactured at a very large scale with a reach that makes it obviously right. disbalanced. Yeah, yeah. and I, I think that's always been the case, although maybe not the future. Let's who knows right so and in the in the, at least the english language part of comics youtube it's great to have um videos like yours that are from outside one particular you know you're not from england you're not from australia or you're not from a uh a english language producing country as far as i know <laughs> so you see it you you view it all equally in a sense like my view is so funneled through the comic book shop the U.S. comic book shop. Well, yes, and I think that might be a bigger divide between us than the the language or the nature of the reading. You know, and as you were saying, when we look at prose, we might find, even if it's not in the reading, a much more, uh, a much greater level of overlap in the systems. But I find that comic book shop, that sort of weekly full list of monthly titles everything, you know, releasing on a Tuesday and reading the stories in that chapter by chapter format, that I find to be very different from the way that I at least read comics, even as an adult, uh, for for the vast majority of my life. So I think there's that there are those kind of differences that have to do with the distribution and with the way that things are consumed. Uh, 
which which I'm always fascinated by and which what I find great about your videos and other people's videos is that they give me that sort of insight into that in a very authentic way without all of the editing and the, you know, presentation being for, I, I don't know, for sales, you know, like with, right. when, when people right. have like, here are the latest releases, affiliate links below, et cetera. There's nothing wrong with that, but, you know, they're serving an information purpose and what's available purpose that's very different from what I see from your channel, which is about the experience of what did I read this week? Right. What am I it's looking forward to week next week? the week by week experience of a comic yeah. book reader. Yeah, yes. which is completely different and completely alien uh, to me. So it was more natural for you to do a, sh a thing where you do a, a bigger overview, in a sense. You look at the bigger picture of a certain book or, or, uh, or a series or whatever you choose to look at, but um, you don't have that week-to-week -week rhythm that, that shapes my show. So yeah, when you... I'm not oh, current. <laughs> that's that. That's the difference. That's the key right. difference. I have no idea what's going on right now. But I'm saying that that's a that's a strength, or you've made it a strength. Um, <laughs> yeah, I I think um, when I first started making videos, I didn't think there would be anyone watching videos outside a couple of people I knew online, like through Facebook or WhatsApp or things like that. So mm -hmm. I was I thought I was making videos for a group of people mainly based in India. So right. for me, the initial thing was about talking about things as in here are things you could check out and here are things you could read and here's something worth. And of course, I would be talking about what was available to buy over here in India. I had a couple of other things, but I wanted to provide like some context behind that. So I almost approached it in reverse where I talk about the series first. And then I'd show some singles about it in a separate but related video to say that now that we've talked about the story and I mentioned over there, it was originally published in singles. Here's a look at the singles, but I didn't want to make the look at the objects, particularly because they were so unique or so alien or things that people were, you know, I didn't want to make that first. So I think that was the kind of decision is what's worth checking out and why is a bigger sort of thing and then the individual chapters or the series or the runs within it can be discussed and evaluated separately right and i think if if we were to go back look at your early videos and then trace your progress uh i meant to talk about being a reader not a video maker but anyway uh <laughs> that we'd probably see you becoming aware of a a different audience in a sense that it well, the first videos of yours I saw seemed uh, they they were very well lit and very and you always speak very well, but they were a little more. Um, here's a stack of books that I think you might want to read. Um, I don't know if you remember that, but <laughs> the funny thing is, I also I I just assumed in my head that you were in London, <laughs> <laughs> maybe because of your choices of books. <laughs> It just didn't occur to me that you would be in India until a long time later. Yeah, well, and it's a very anonymous sort of set, you know, it could be anywhere. Right. It's just my right. bedroom or with the bookshelves, etc. Yes. So I'm not out there vlogging in a particular way. I And I have a, like a couple of things. But yes, I think that's interesting that you would say that. And when I, again, looking at your videos, when I look at your videos, Part of it is also reading the comments of a very close community of people yes, who are obviously community. coming back yeah. to watch your videos. But no, but it's that it's that sort of they look forward to the next thing you're releasing. You know, they're looking forward to it's not something that came across on their recommended thing and they were browsing and they had no idea right, about. Right. I mean, th th there's just that aspect. And, I didn't know much about YouTube when I started. I knew YouTube as a place to look up stuff, but I didn't know that you could have an account and right. I didn't know that you can subscribe or I did have some vague idea, but I didn't know what it was because I never logged into YouTube. It's only when I started mm -hmm. logging in through Google that I realized, oh, all this, this stuff is not that difficult. Before I was just like, I'm not logging in. I'm not giving any information. Right. I just watch the videos that someone sent me a link to. And so it's some sort of a repository. This whole idea of having subscribers and having people who follow each other and watch each other's videos, this was sort of a discovery to me. So when I was, 
when I started making videos, I didn't think about it like that because I didn't have that surrounding. You know, there was, mm -hmm. I, I didn't have anybody else to talk to about comics online, etc. So it was more like, um, so like my original videos were all kind of spotlight videos. So I would make one on Usagi Ojimbo and one on Bone and one on Sandman. And then I'd talk about a couple of edition comparisons or things like that. So I used to make like these portfolio videos that say, what is Tintin? And then I'd have a different video in which was like, here are all the 22 albums of Tintin. And then I'd have a third video in which I do <laughs> a color comparison of Tintin. So it's almost like right. I wanted to set the ground first. So the third video would make more sense to people because the first two videos were there. So that's what I was trying to, you know, sort of put forward where it mm -hmm. isn't an established audience. You'd have no idea who's going to watch your video. So you're just like, let me, let me make them in a way that makes them accessible or understandable to someone just stumbling across it or vaguely interested in it, I suppose. Yeah. Well, okay. So I misconstrued because I must have seen some slightly more casual videos that you must have done a little later on then and thought those were the first ones. But no, I mean, I think, uh, yeah, because people said, you know, do a uh, recent acquisitions or recent buys right. and stuff like that. And a lot of videos that I saw were like that. And for the longest time, I didn't want to do haul videos. I uh, it was just like mm -hmm. I was being snobby and I was like, no, I don't want to. When I watch those videos, it I'm, I'm titillated and I'm attracted to them, but I don't know if I leave with anything right. of substance other than spend more money, buy more stuff. You know, like what is the value of what I would do if I would just put stuff out there, you know, buy this, buy this, etc. So I had all of this stuff, but then I found that like middle ground that if I could say that I've read something and I could say that that's what I've recently read, but it was a lower, you're right. It's a, it was a little easier to do without all the editing and all the image insertion and all those other mm -hmm. things that you want to do in those other videos. So they became sort of a, another kind of video I could do while I worked on videos that were more laborious or required a little bit more attention because they were casual. So, yeah, so it's not, it's, it, they, they ran sort of parallel to those kind of things. But yeah, it's funny that I started making videos about a single book or a single series, whereas I think uh, what people like to see are videos in which you talk about a lot of comics and a lot of books, <laughs> well, which is uh, which which is an interesting uh, experiment, I think. I mean, I, I think you're you're very, in my mind, very successful in the way in the way doing it. However, feels naturally to you. But um, well, another funny thing is uh, my first comment on one of your videos, I'm pretty sure, was telling you to go to in stock trades <laughs> because I, and, and then I was like, Oh, right. He's in England. That won't work. <laughs> I didn't even know it really how much won't further work. out that. <laughs> yeah. Yes. I mean, it's always a source of comedy for us where, you know, the envy that you would feel at uh -huh. someone living in the United States, even Canada, right. you know, um, the UK because of the plethora of choices as far as, yes used books are concerned, you know, and I think that is a a key part of my uh, reading was the ability to buy a lot of used books. And I don't think it would have been the same if it had all been new stuff and all at list price or close and things like that. And that is, I think th there is that thing of look at the variety and look at all the new stuff. But I think more than more than that, I'm envious of having the the back issues bins and the you know the quarter yeah. bins apparently are still a thing as I found out <laughs> for recently. Some people, yeah, yeah, for some people, um, fifty so, cent is as low as I can find. But <laughs> wow, that's still that's still amazing. It's I mean, like I was, I, I found a box of things that are a dollar ten, and I thought it was fantastic yeah. here in New Delhi. So, uh, so yes, I I I like that idea of having those used books out there and ex library books out there, or just what people decided to sell because they don't want it anymore. And someone else can pick it up at a, you know, at a reasonable price and read a good story. That's the, that's the stuff whenever people say in stock trades or, Oh, it's here on eBay. I'm just like, nah, only if only. Right. 
And hey, you can read it on Hoopla digitally, and you can go yes, to the, go to the library. <laughs> yeah, if 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 only we had libraries, you know, I think that uh -huh. that is that would be fantastic. It but would be... Public libraries are not a thing that uh, happened in India or are rare. Or... Mm, not really, not at the level they are in the United States, and with the kind of resources and infrastructure there, for sure. Uh, you would have things, but they wouldn't be. Um, they wouldn't be at the level that we would want them. And I mm -hmm. don't think that comics and foreign comics, et cetera, right. would necessarily make the cut. I mean, again, there are a lot of reading libraries, lending libraries in very small community spaces and mm -hmm. co-op type of spaces. They, I, you know, you, you just have to be very, very local to know them. But right. for the vast, you know, in my experience over the last 30 years or so, they've just shrunk and fewer mm -hmm. and fewer of them exist. Um, although there are things, yeah, but not, not in the massive way that would be, you know, here is a place where you can go and either find anything or get anything on loan from another library and ask for, you know, requesting that kind of infrastructure doesn't exist. So, um, yeah, so it's all, it's all purchase or digital. And of course, <laughs> you and I have a different uh, approach to digital comics and, you know, I've, I've, I've tried, but it's not my... I can't, I can't quite do it. I think there are some things that are getting close, but still I, and, and there's a lot of physical stuff to read. Right. So there's plenty, uh, of good, but yeah, well, but for instance, myself, uh, well, I, I kind of like reading on my iPad, but right. since there is hoopla from my library, which is 10 free graphic novels a month, why not, you know, yeah. <laughs> why not dip in, but, but anyway, one of your, <laughs> No, I, I'm gonna. <laughs> one oh, one go thing ahead. I just it just it, I remember this. I was watching one of your videos, one of your uh, Sunday live streams, and you were talking about a particular um, panel by panel thing, which wasn't like the guided view, and it was a better thing. And you were, I think, you demonstrated it, and I watched that video really carefully because I was like, this might be, and that was my my thing is that I I completely got the clarity of the panel. But the fact that I was looking at one panel at a time itself was the deal breaker for me in reading comics. The fact that all that is in my field of vision is that one panel, even if I'm actually reading it on a page with focus, it's always mm -hmm. part of a larger arrangement. Page and it's design, yeah. Yeah. And then I've had a particular flow to get there and I've got a certain anticipation based out of what I can see out of the corner of my eye. For me, in comics, that's such a fundamental part of reading comics that the more things get separated from each other as individual pieces of art or individual blocks of text, the more uh, the more tiresome I find reading it. Like I just get exhausted mm -hmm. more because it seems like I'm sort of stopping and starting in a way that I don't when I'm reading prose or comics otherwise. But I mean, it was just interesting because I was very interested in that technology and that flow that you were demonstrating over I there. I can't remember what that was. <laughs> but, um, but it ended up being like a, the later. other way around where I was just mm -hmm. like, okay, this convinces me that I don't think it's it's going to be for me. It might be the, the kind of comic that origin was originated by the Koreans, which flows continuously. And is so the it, comic is made for the screen. Yeah. That, and it's that made I for think the is phone. a different and thing. I don't like reading on the phone, but I, I do it on the iPad of and it just keeps flowing. Yeah. Um, it's like one long continuous page, I guess. Yeah, I and I've seen some comics that are I side scrolling that way cruel. also. Like <laughs> is that Ed the Happy Clown? Yes, yes. I just got Ed the Happy Clown from the library. <laughs> Haven't read it yet. Um so what was available to young Angshuman when he first became a reader? Well, um, one interesting thing is that when I was young, there were plenty of comics around. At least that's my right. memory of it. Uh, comics were not hard to find. Comics were hard to convince your parents that they should let <laughs> you read. It was more. It was more along that line. But and, and that was just without anything lurid or anything um violent or exploitative even even without that it was just right. it's lesser reading it's you know it's a little mm -hmm. frivolous and i think there was a comics company that's still around in india that published a lot of history and myth and folklore 
in comics form. And that was one of the things that parents were like, okay, you can read that. You know, that's <laughs> that's good for right. you or that'll teach you something about culture and uh, things like that. So so, reading is supposed to improve your mind in your yes, parents' Yes, absolutely. Viewing. Reading is for <laughs> improvement. And and that's true. Not, I mean, so there's, 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 there's a whole school of thought where reading is only for studying and getting particular grades in standardized right. exams, uh, you know, which helps you get a good job, etc. Yeah. But even where reading for your betterment of your mind, it must be, you know, it must have a, some sort of value. It must be getting you uh, more intellectually. Yeah, you've right. got to be making intellectual progress. And so frivolity and all of that stuff, it's a, that was the real thing. But the comics that did, we did they read, have trouble with that. you reading novels also fiction no. in general no, no 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 very i mean my parents not at all but in general you wouldn't but yes in my family reading was great so uh -huh. that's also another reason why we got to read comics because it's still reading right. so i think my parents my so parents they, they in didn't general say no Edgar Rice or, or you know no science fiction because that's bad for you too. Or no, no, no. I don't. I don't remember ever being told um, <laughs> not to read anything. In fact, I probably found a couple of books on my mother's bookshelf that weren't age appropriate. You know that right. I picked up and read because oh, it had a naked woman on the cover. You know uh -huh. that you're just like oh my god, this D. H. Lawrence is really very very tough to read. So you're not. You're not really sure what you, but if you've got the books around the place, then you kind of are encouraged to read anyway. So we read a lot, but comics were remember, a little bit more. Uh, not just, I'm just not curious just about comics. Do you remember what was the first thing you read, comics or novel or what have you, that you thought, oh, I really like reading and I, I'm a reader? <laughs> no, I don't think I can remember. Maybe I that's think, an unfair uh, question because I, I yeah, have, well, have that in my own head. But Oh, you do? Which one is yeah. it for you? It was a series of historical novels about Vikings. It's called Viking Dawn. I can't remember what the middle, there was a trilogy, Viking Dawn, Viking something, and then Viking Sunset. So you followed this Viking from being a young Viking to a middle-aged Viking to an old man. And I was enraptured. <laughs> that probably wow. led me to Conan and the like. But <laughs> How old, how old were you when you read those books? Nine. And it was, uh, my family traveled around a lot. So it was in the summer we were in Paris, which sounds really exciting. But when you're nine, <laughs> actually being in Paris with no friends is not exciting. <laughs> and that's yeah. when I, I read that trilogy of books. <clears throat> and um, now I can't remember the author's name. It's Henry something. And I looked it up. All these books are out of print now. Uh, and I read oh, some. Oh, you others. don't have any. You don't have any copies at home. No, no, I don't. They were not saved somehow. Maybe because we were traveling right. uh, back from Paris or something. Um, and so maybe I bought them in Paris at an English language library. And then the next big memory is a uh, Edgar Rice Burroughs book called "The Land That Time Forgot," right. with a Frank Frazetta cover with a an ape man carrying a basically naked, very pale woman <laughs> through the jungle. <laughs> right. Um, so those are the books that I remember of, oh, I like to read. <laughs> um, and then yeah, I, came a little later for me. I think, I think uh, reading, the younger you get into it, the more likely you are to stick with it, I think. But at the mm -hmm. same time, someone once told me, uh, explained to me that every kid loves to read when they learn to read. It's more right. like you fall out of love with reading at some point of time and some people either come back or some people don't fall out of love with right. it. So, I mean, I, it sounds kind of right. I don't know if it's true, but uh -huh. if so, it would probably be like, luckily, I kind of never let go of it after I started reading. So going from being excited to reading, you know, the toothpaste box, you know, just <laughs> continued from there. <laughs> like anything you can read is is uh, is fantastic but yeah i i really enjoyed reading and i probably read a lot when i was a kid and my parents encouraged it but there were certain lines like i remember being banned from reading at the table at meal times because i would just be reading and eating at the same time and not talk to anyone and all that stuff and 
then I would start doing it when we were on vacation and visiting relatives. And that mm -hmm. was just very, very rude. And so I think one summer vacation, you know, I pushed my luck too much <laughs> and brought the book to the wrong dining table with the full family sitting down to, you know, whom we haven't seen in a year. And I just kept reading. And then after that, so there were those kind of kind of things that came down on particular behaviors. But in general, we were we were encouraged to read mm -hmm. and bought books and stuff. Do you remember discovering certain genres that you know stimulated you or or was it all started so early that it's all just sort of jumbled together well i mean i think yeah because it, it was so early but i i remember reading an illustrated version of hans christian anderson's stories and mm -hmm. it was some um you know auntie in the neighborhood some friend of my mother's whose uh, place I would be left at and, you know, given a couple of books to read. So it was kind of like the books were the babysitter, but they were, they were superb. Like these things were mm -hmm. incredible. So I had read some flimsier <clears throat> Hans Christian adaptation, you know, magazine adaptation type of thing for kids that were cute cartoons and very simply written, but these were pretty dark. And I think they were an original translation, but they had these beautiful, gorgeous, paintings, which in my memory now uh, seem like Charles Vess. You know, I have no idea which editions these were or which illustrations, but I think that's what they looked like. Right. Um, and and that made me think like mythology, fairy tales, those kind of things. Those were my first loves, as in that uh -huh. kind of storytelling. Um, but it was, it was kind of omnivorous. So, you know, the adventure right. stuff, and then you had these classics in a bridge classics, Robinson Crusoe, and those kind of things, but I love them. And once I discovered comics, I also discovered comics adaptations and versions of some classics. And they were like, I remember reading Kidnapped in an abridged children's edition mm -hmm. book, and it was very boring. And I remember reading a Kidnapped <clears throat> comic book, you know, a couple of years later, and it was a dynamic story. It was, right. it was fantastic, <laughs> you know, so, 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 so they kind of, the prose and the comics kind of fed off of each other and bounced off of each other. But Tintin, for example, was a big deal when I was a right. kid. So and, when did the, uh, the first ones were the ones that your parents approved of that were Indi probably, uh, Indian yeah. culturally rela related comics? Yeah. And, and then when Tintin. did Tintin come out? Uh, Tintin was exactly I think almost time? simultaneously. I think uh -huh. almost simultaneously. Tintin, the, the Tintin comics were very expensive. So yes. you couldn't just go out and just buy an album. Right. So... <clears throat> You'd read it at a friend's place and then you would bother your parents and then maybe on your birthday you'd get one. So right. there they're, you go. they're fancy volumes, not not oh, fancy yeah. throwaway things. I'm trying to learn. And French, these are the hardcovers. So I mean, I think when I was young, we didn't even know hardcovers existed. We just the paperback magazine ones was such high quality compared to the newsprint comics, mm -hmm. you know, with non-laminated covers, stapled right. books that we were used to seeing. So the Tintin albums represented a completely different world in production and color and 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 the artwork matched it that you know that clear line thing was like nothing we had seen in were you the more... switching between languages um what was no, the I, was the indian I stuff in mainly. english or in hindi or there are there, there were there were hindi comics and there were uh -huh. translations into different languages but I read them mainly in English and uh -huh. I read prose mainly in English, I, almost so. Uh -huh. So your reading uh, brain is mostly used to English. My reading brain is definitely an English <laughs> brain, unfortunately. And it's not because, you know, I was living outside of India. I was like, right. I was living in <laughs> India, but right. that's just what I read. And I think some of it had to do with availability and some of it just had to do with how many times I needed to switch. So I mm. had a lot of books available to me in English, which right. uh, may not have been the case in other languages. So I never made the effort to learn the other languages as deeply as I learned English. But it's because I read so many English books that I, you know, again, it's circular. I don't know which came mm -hmm. first. Is it because right. I was Once you've read a lot of English, English you're going to keep reading it. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, almost all of it was, uh, was that way. But you, it, Tintin isn't popular in the United States, right? I mean, I know it's got its pockets of appreciation, but given its popularity over the decades in the US, most kids don't grow up reading Tintin. I, I don't think I ever even heard of Tintin until we traveled to Europe. 
Um, and then I would, I think I, see, I, I lived in France in that, in Paris when I was nine for a brief while. And then I lived in Switzerland when I was 14. And I'm a little confused whether, did I only know about Tintin when I turned 14? I don't mm. think I was surprised when I would see lots of Tintin in Switzerland. So I think I must have seen images of Tintin right. without reading him uh, when I was nine back in Fran uh, Paris. Um, but, and I didn't, I, I know I knew who Asterix and Obelix were because I had in Paris, I had a, um, was like this mold that you put plaster of Paris inside of and mm -hmm. let it harden and you pull it off and then you've got Obelix. Right. And I painted Obelix. So I must, and I remember being very careful. So you knew the that, colors. The stripes on his pants and everything. Right. And I was fascinated <laughs> by him, but I, it was, wasn't till what I was 14 or 15 that I got a hold of a British copy of uh, Asterix and got to read it. So uh, my brain was already completely warped by Stan Lee at that point. But right. um, <laughs> <laughs> so so for me, unfortunately, uh, Asterix and Obelix were mere sort of ghosts in the distance uh, when I was <laughs> the right age to read them. Right. Although, yeah. uh, I, I delight in reading them um, right now uh, as as the uh, translations, the new translations come out. I've been reading them digitally with my daughter. Um, right, right. Asterisk. The paper cuts. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and they're definitely like you did your video on it. And I think they've gotten worse as they go along. Um, <laughs> oh, that's unfortunate. <laughs> the, the, the few problems you found with it, I think they build up more. We still oh, have a fun really time reading it. And yeah, when I'm when we're reading together digitally, panel by panel really helps because to look to be sitting next to somebody and look at a page like this and be reading out loud, they don't know which panel you're on. Right. It becomes yeah. quite confusing. Makes so, sense. Um, Absolutely. So it's been very handy to to use those paper cuts ones because the uh, British versions are not available digitally that I could find anywhere. Right. No, it's interesting because uh, thinking about Tintin and Asterix and Obelix in their translated forms, obviously, they were also instrumental for teaching me English in many uh -huh. ways. So there were, there were a lot of the Indian comics that I read used vocabulary that we knew. So, mm -hmm. you know, like they were written for children, but they were written for children in English. So there was a safety boundary sort of mm -hmm. it was all very understandable and it was all very clear and i think that in language affected... that uh english speaking indians would use as children yes i suppose yes yeah. and and or i mean i mean it wouldn't be slang or colloquial you know right. because no it's going to be proper and it's going to be grammatical right. probably to a fault you know which obviously mm -hmm. affected the energy and uh, the things you know it was all very uh, which works in some mythic contexts and things like right. that but but it was still limited in that way that uh, a lot of these comics at that young age, Tintin and Asterix and Obelix, just they were full of words I didn't know. And that mm -hmm. made reading sort of exciting because you would read it and you would read a couple of different adventures. And over time, you just make up a meaning for the word. So the indomitable right. goals, you know, I am 100% sure that that's, <laughs> that's where I learned the word indomitable from. Right. There's I'm no sure other way yes. I could have learned it. Yeah, and I once made a list of all the words I had learned from Tintin. And it was like a humongous list. You know, it included things like forger. Uh, so, mm -hmm. the, yeah, so not only historically contextual languages, etc. It's so much came from these comics at an early age, which made everything a lot more confusing but but also a lot more interesting as far you right. know so so i think that's one of the things that really appealed to me about comics is that both visually <clears throat> and textually they were like just expanding your boundaries because they weren't trying to provide a context for their style because they were made right. for some other uh, other regions you know who had the context so you had to just sort of decipher everything so the fact that you're looking at a European comic that was actually written and drawn in the 1940s in like 1980s India is just like there's just layer after layer of confusion yeah. and you know wonder. <laughs> yeah. 
probably not at that high a level, but I did when I started reading Marvel comics at the time, uh, just when Stan Lee had stopped writing, but everyone was trying to write like him. They tried to use big words all the time. Like that was part of the fun of it. And you could tell they were using the big words just for fun. And I that increased my, my vocabulary, I believe, and made it easier to read novels. Um, yeah. Because it the, the picture, the combination of words and pictures gives you so much more context that you um that you figure out the vocabulary more quickly. Absolutely. I remember but, I mean, in uh in uh when I when I was reading Conan, he used the word cul-de-sac all the time. Uh, <laughs> and I couldn't figure out what that meant until Conan in the comic books went into a cul cul-de-sac, and then it was obvious, oh, a cul-de-sac is like a dead end in uh so there you go. Uh, my my <laughs> example. You, do you remember? Do you remember what your first Marvel comics were? Yes. I mean, character, if not writer, or yeah. No, exactly. One hundred percent. Wow. <laughs> it's uh, Avengers ninety three, <laughs> written by Roy Thomas, art by uh, Neil Adams. I I didn't know at the time it was the beginning of the Kree Scroll War. Um, wow. <laughs> but. Uh, but it blew my mind because it it had so many science fiction concepts packed into one issue. Uh, there's an android. Might have been my first encountering of the word android. Mm -hmm. Ant Man goes inside the android's body and fights his artificial antibodies inside there, and has other adventures inside the android's body. Then we get Andy the scroll. What did I say it wrong? No, no. <laughs> I was just, I was just, I was just. Antibodies is just so fitting right there. But. <laughs> yeah. So, um, and then you had the, you know, the Skrulls who were shape changers and spaceships. It, it was just so much science fiction packed. And I probably just begun to be aware of science fiction at that age, uh, packed into one issue. Yeah, um, that sounds like, so... yeah, that, that sounds a, like a lot mainlined in 32, 32 pages. Yeah, it was it was during a brief period where Marvel did uh, forty eight page comics. Oh, well, um, so that's part of why they could pack so much in. So it was almost like two issues in one. But um, but it, it being childhood and it was summertime, I just read it and reread it and reread it till I understood everything um, or thought I did. Did you get to read the next issues at like ninety no, four? No, no, not wow, till you just had ninety. Not till ten or twelve years later. <laughs> the next comic I got was a Captain America with a uh, cliffhanger where the the evil alien is revealed to be kidnapping children. <laughs> and he's got all the children in tubes. And that's the last page. <laughs> and that took me 20 years to find the next issue. Oh, wow. <laughs> did you did you get to find out what had happened or did you have to wait 20 years to read it to actually find out? Yeah, it was a bit of a letdown. All oh, right. That's but, unfortunate. <clears throat> but eventually I subscribed to comics uh, so that I would get every issue. And also right. it was a way around my parents' restrictions on how many comics I could get. Because they were very concerned about reading comics would rot your mind. Reading science fiction would rot your mind. Listening uh, to rock and roll would rot your mind. So those were the three things I loved. <laughs> right, of course. <laughs> but, I um, mean, I think I learned the word subscribe from either Marvel or DC Comics. Uh -huh. Okay. You know, that's just like, I'd never encountered that word before. And I was like, well, what is it that these guys can do and have <laughs> comics show up at their door? Can we do it? You know, like this idea. And I think, and I think it was something ridiculous where it was like enclose one dollar for shipping or in enclose uh -huh. like 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 they gave an amount of money for six months subscription and mm -hmm. maybe it was a dollar fifty for six months subscription. So I remember like telling my parents like, hey, can we get this subscription for a dollar fifty? Let alone like we're in <laughs> India, you know, we have no understanding. And I remember my father saying, a dollar fifty, do you know how much that is? And it was just like even that was <laughs> A ridiculous amount at the exchange rates at that time or what have you and it's just like that's how ridiculously out of reach this notion of subscription right. was where you can magically have things show up and then they give you extra stuff for subscribing and you get like 
a hat or a badge or something uh-huh. like that. Those are the ads we used to see, you know, in those in those issues as so well. So your first Marvel or DC was this uh, British reprints or? No, actually, I read American. I read American comics when I was young, and they were available. And they were available in a couple of different ways. They were available as imports of old comics, um, or even you know contemporary comics from the United States that you could find from time to time at a like a used bookstore or. Yes, like what we had and may have like some variations of we had like street stalls for newspapers and Mm -hmm. magazines and periodicals and you could get them there. So if you had a neighborhood street stall, you could go and tell them to get you something whenever it came out or to hold you a copy very similar to that kind of pull list thing. But there's no way of having any guarantee the way that distribution was, you know, what would show up, what the publishers decided to print might be you know so the indian comics were sort of anthology or standalone issues and a lot Mm -hmm. of the stories that we read were anthology or standalone issues just because you couldn't guarantee that the next copy would you know the next issue would be something you get but we got american comics in fact i was just thinking about that story that you said i read a batman um a batman story with the gentleman ghost and I had never heard of the Gentleman Ghost character. And it was like the story was written as if Batman was meeting the Gentleman Ghost for the first time. So I don't know if it's a first appearance or if it's a sort of revisitation story or something like that. But I read the first part and it ended with Alfred knocking Batman out because he threatened the Gentleman Ghost. And that was a cliffhanger that I still don't know what happened because I was just like, you know, I, I actually don't want to because it'll be it'll be very disappointing, I'm sure. So I still haven't found out why Alfred knocked Bruce out. <laughs> I guess it was mind control or something like that. Huh. Wow. I wonder. And you don't remember like who the writer or artist or anything like that would be on, on that particular I think it was story. Neil Adams or... Oh, a Neil Adams written by okay, yeah, or or written by Denny O'Neill. Mm-hmm. I might be, um, but I think so. Hmm. Well, maybe some been... of our, some of my viewers will know what issue that was. <laughs> yeah, the, and uh... it was another one of those that I didn't have a cover, so I don't even know what the cover of that issue looks like. I just know that you know he tries to throw his batarang, and it goes through the space between his gloves and his cuffs. Like there's no wrist hmm. there. Very cool. Right, you know, as right. a kid, I was like, whoa, he's a really a ghost. <laughs> that proves it. <laughs> I mostly know the gentleman ghost actually from the uh, Brave and Bold TV show. Uh, I don't know if you've seen that one, but he shows I know up a I lot. Have it. It's very funny. It's a it's a it's a good Batman Brave and the Bold. It's from the nineties, I think, or early two thousands. Oh, okay. Um, but you've you've moved on from superheroes, I suppose, most of the no, no, I still, I, I, I end up watching all of the superhero movies, even, you know, even if I feel very bad about it later. I mean, a couple of them are fun, but I, I read superhero comics from time to time, but I have a great fondness for the superhero comics of my childhood. Right. And even, you know, of my college years when I returned to that, I have no uh-huh. acrimony against them. I just you like, remember what, what era roughly... Like what kind of things were going on in comics when you first encountered the superheroes then? Well, when I was very young, we used to read all kinds of stuff from all over. So have you ever read Archie Archie comics? That's another yes, thing, you know, which no one ever talks about. I'm like, do you guys know how influential Archie <laughs> comics were at a certain period of time right. as far as propagating the myth of America, propagating, you know, oh what my. is the United States, the chocolate <laughs> shop and having that car and going to the you know, drive-in or whatever, as antiquated as it sounds, it was like American graffiti all the time, you know, in different <laughs> time periods. Archie Comics doing that across the world. Never experienced anything like Archie Comics in my real life, <laughs> ever. <laughs> not, not even close. <laughs> but, uh, but uh, yeah, what was the question? Made? There was an interesting thing about Archie Comics, but I got completely distracted now. Was Sorry there superheroes that. in Archie Comics? I know there were. Is that where you were, where you were going? Or No, no. Um, I, I was just, I, I, I forgot or what I was talking about. Or were those early introduction to a U.S. comics? 
Right. So we used to, we, we, we saw these Archie comics, we saw uh, Harvey comics, you know, so there was Richie Rich and Casper and mm -hmm. Wendy. And so, so it was very spread out. There wasn't like this whole idea that comics are one thing. Sometimes when people, you know, like when they argue is like comics aren't just superheroes. I mean, I think it's interesting for me that as a child from childhood onwards, I never thought comics were any one thing because even in right. those Indian comics anthologies about mythology, you also had biography, you also had, you know, history. So comics being nonfiction, for example, uh, using speech balloons in the mouths of real life people and independence fighters and things like that in the freedom struggle stories, they just were like, you could do different things with them. So when I first encountered superheroes, which I think was Spider-Man, I saw the TV cartoon show before mm -hmm. I ever read a Spider-Man comic. And when I read the comic, I was like, oh, I, that, I love that TV show. And I picked up that comic and I remember reading the first Spider-Man comic and going, this is 500 times better than that TV show. Look at the <laughs> yeah. way Spider-Man moves. You know, like the TV show is piece. Like after that, watching the TV show was like, it felt like cardboard cutouts being, anim you know, like the, the rudimentariness of that animation was yeah. magical at one point of time. And then I read the comics and then I just read two Spider-Man comics and it was, it was over. I couldn't watch that TV show anymore yeah. because the comics were so much better. So even though they weren't new, they were kind of mind blowing because the kind of dynamism they had and the way things moved was like unlike any other comic, you know, including the European Tintin and all of that right. stuff. Everything looked a lot more staid and a lot more mannered in comparison uh, to this. And this is still just 70s, 80s Marvel right. DC, not even, you know, 90s or image. So, uh, well, so how far along in your progress as a reader did it happen that you came across like the Spider-Man? Are we talking 10 years old or 15? Yeah, about, or? I mean, again, they seem all smooshed into, you know, this sort of a period. period of time. Yeah, into a very short period of of, of reading. I, I know that I probably stopped reading comics around 15 or 16, mm -hmm. even though, you know, I remember being in high school and still being the guy who knew something about comics uh, right. or talked about comics every now and then because it wasn't that common at all. And I remember being in school um, and this is long time before the movies, et cetera. And there was one other kid who had a sticker of Thor on his pencil box. And mm -hmm. I was like, that, that, that kid is cool. That kid knows what's up, you know, it's just like me and him. That's just, and nobody else has nobody any else. idea. And so, so, so did you have I, a sense of other kids knowing Asterix and Tintin or was that yeah. sort of a, yeah. So, so that was a so common some people knowledge. read, some people read Tintin and Asterix, some people read Archie, some people read those Indian comics and the mythology comics and, mm -hmm. and some people didn't read comics at all because their parents right. thought it would rot their brain or it's not real reading. Um, others, you know, like just didn't read anything. So it was, it's all a mixture. I don't remember anything being dominant or anything being you know but maybe that's just fuzzy <laughs> fuzzy right. memories was it like very stratified or growing up did you find there to be a very clear line between who read comics and who doesn't read comics as a very black and white thing i in my experience it's not true for everyone but basically reading comics was in the closet so i had a friend in high school who also read comics, but I didn't find out till we were in our late twenties that he read comics. And we hung out every day for years <laughs> without ever mentioning comics to each other. Now wow. around age 16, I kind of stopped reading comics very much either. Um, I think because I thought it would hurt my chance with girls <laughs> <laughs> and I wanted to spend my money on other things. Um, I can't, completely put my, I, I, at some point I said, I'm, I'm through with comics and I sold a large number of my comics to wow. some guy who was advertising in the local newspaper um, to buy comics. And my father saw him drive, drive away from our, down our driveway and said he had a giant smile on his face. So he must've got a very good deal from me. Oh, 
do you do you spend a lot of time thinking about what was part of that shipment? Do you do you like have some sort of uh, only since I've started doing YouTube, I started thinking about it. I just put it out of my mind. Um, but like a lot of Conan and you know Barry Smith Conan and that Neil Adams Avengers and such like was in there. I mean, I think he paid me twenty five dollars. <laughs> what? <laughs> But this is, uh, what would it be, 1977. The comics weren't worth that much. There was a lot, There were the, the comics I thought were my most valuable were uh, were Jack Kirby DC comics, Commandy and uh, New Gods and that kind of thing. And a few years later, I discovered they weren't valuable at all, um, at least at that time. So I figured the guy hadn't ripped me off that much. But, um, I feel like the comics, like as you were referring to vocabulary and stuff, they made me a more flexible reader and it made it easier to read other things that are maybe kind of difficult reads. Uh, for me, it was all, you know, the more advanced kind of science fiction. And But I'd say by the time I was 16, I was also, I was more trying to be a literary pretentious guy and, you know, <laughs> read Thomas Pynchon and that kind of thing. Right. Um, so I was sort of giving up on science fiction a little bit too, but not really. I was secretly what? reading, uh, Ed, uh, what it was, I was very into, um, Philip Jose Farmer during that period when all the river world books were coming out. I don't know if you know them. No, I'm not familiar, but I mean, there's some pinch you can classify as science fiction if you want. True, to. true. Right. True. So, <laughs> yeah, but it's it's interesting because I think that uh, if it wasn't your parents or somebody else telling you that at some point of time, it seems like, oh, you're telling you that, okay, this is not as right. worthwhile as this other stuff, you know, real literature and real mm -hmm. reading and things like that. Uh, I, I guess the... So what, why do you think you stopped? Were you thinking it wasn't real literature and that's why you stopped? Or did it just bore you at some point? Yeah, well, I mean, it's interesting because I would keep reading the comics that I had uh, over and over again. So it wasn't like I stopped right. reading the comics medium. It's just that I didn't go out and look for new comics. And I think part of that was because the things of my childhood, when there were so many, you know, as I was saying, comics were everywhere, they seemed mm -hmm. to dry up where they weren't. There were a whole okay. bunch of different publishers who used to publish in the 80s, through the late 80s, who disappeared and who went under. And then there were a bunch of imports and stuff that used to be available that just weren't available. Or maybe I just wasn't you know, aware of where they were. Uh -huh. And a lot of that could be about my, but so I didn't go and something, seek them out. Something may have changed in the economics of publishing at that point in India or the economics of selling. I don't know. The... Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, of course, and there were economic upheavals yeah, and there was a, mm -hmm. a liberalization of an economy that was before, you know, kind of a closed off or not closed off, but a, a more insular, insular right. and, you know, and became more globalized in the in the early 90s, etc. So, but I mean, I'm not sure. I, I don't know enough to know whether that right. affected anything because later there were companies that did the same thing, that they reprinted DC and Marvel comics in India at a low price point in shrunken down versions. Mm -hmm. um, but again, the business model, uh, something. But the comics that I was reading at home continued to be great. I thought they were I, great. But yes, I did, I did read a lot of prose, but I was reading prose from a young age. But yes, I, I do wanted to be a little pretentious and read real literature and find uh, real things. But I liked, I liked um, pulpy stuff as well, but mm -hmm. not, I didn't have access to like huge, uh, you know, strings. So every now and then I'd pick, you know, I'd find like a cheap paperback or something like that. But then I started finding that there was good uh, stuff that played on the pulpy stuff tropes, which mm -hmm. became the thing I liked because I I could read something that was like a, a, a crime fiction, which was very hard boiled. And I'd kind of be attracted to some parts of it. And then the rest of it would be sort of boring because of the same things. And then I'd read like a really good crime, which was almost like literature. And so then I was like, oh, so the borders between these things aren't actually as, as strict as people right. make it sound. Yes. 
So uh, can you think of examples of that? Is it, are we talking John le Carré or? Uh... Well, I mean, with the, uh, uh, well, m m much later it was, I liked Elmo Leonard. Elmo um, Leonard, okay. Yeah, I, I, I loved Elmo Leonard's writing. I loved uh, uh, James Elroy. Um, uh, I haven't but, read anything. But, but in science fiction, which was much younger. So the crime stuff mm -hmm. became, but it was based on a lot of like these, uh, adventures for young boys and things that come out of that. So right. having that sort of pulp kind of thing, it seems like a logical step from the Hardy Boys onto this, onto that, because you kind of got crime and investigation and it's all safe mm -hmm. for kids and it you you add the danger or you add the lasciviousness, you know, a little bit at a time. So I could I could I could see that, but I don't remember those titles. But when when reading science fiction, I think mm -hmm. for me it was it was discovering Isaac Asimov. That was, I think, like for most people. But I was just, uh -huh. we used to go to this school library exercise and they had this weird thing where they would march you into the library and they'd make you sit at this long table and then someone would come by and put down a book in front of you, like just like a random just book. A book. And that's, <laughs> yeah, just a book. Like read this book for the next half an hour for library period and then you'll go to your next class or something. It was the most ridiculous thing. Wow. And... I don't think they were thinking. So then, about the which next books time you were... got back, it would be a different book. Like you didn't get to yeah. finish the book. <laughs> yeah, it was just like you you read for half an hour. You went, and all the kids seemed fine with it. And then right. what happened is they put this book down, and it said uh, it was the Robots of Dawn by Isaac uh -huh. Asimov, which is like oh, okay. a, the third later book on in the, the series. The... Yeah, right. But that was the first thing, and they put it down there, and I started reading <laughs> it. And I was I was hooked. I had no idea what was going on. But I only got, even in that half an hour at full speed reading, I only got like a few, you know, like right. uh, ha, two dozen pages, you know, something like that. So the next library period, I came back there and said, can I get the Robots of Dawn? And like they were like, who is this person? And why are they asking <laughs> for a specific book? Do they not know how this thing works? It was ridiculous. But they gave it to me, you know, like, I think, I think they were just a little too stunned. So they looked it up and they gave me that book. And so... I became the first person in the history of the library, apparently, to request the same book that they were reading last time. That is that is mind blowing. <laughs> it's like they, yeah, there used to be a joke, a really bad joke about someone getting a a book for Christmas, and they said, "Well, but I already have a book." <laughs> <laughs> um, so. <laughs> So did you manage to find Isaac Asimov on your own then? Um, yes, yes. After that, I, I read a lot of Isaac Asimov because I just, uh, like he was a good middle ground because then I read some things that were a little harder science fiction mm -hmm. and they felt a little too out of my reach. I wasn't able to grasp. Right. Um, and, and because I wasn't able to grasp maybe scientific or mathematical concepts, I felt that the character work you know, wasn't doing enough to keep me engaged. So like, right. if they had that, then I don't care about this because I care about the characters, but it was the hard science fiction that I tried to read. And I don't remember who it, you know, what the, but it, it didn't feel engaging to me. And Isaac Asimov felt very engaging to me because he was not because he was creating great characters, but he was creating like these puzzles, you know, and at a certain right. age, you like puzzles, you like murder mysteries and you like, like, how is this going to be solved or, how is this person going to turn the tables with a clever bit of programming or a, yes. or wordplay or something like that? Mm -hmm. So there's there's that kind of stuff because there was puns, you know, and there was right. uh, shaggy dog stories and stuff like that that made it all very exciting, twist in the tail. Of course, I realized much later that, you know, there's this entire Twilight Zone sort of uh, library out there that I could have, but but I didn't have access to the Twilight Zone TV show. And right. when I when I recognized that later, I was like, that, if I had gotten that as a kid, I would have advanced in my reading by like, you know, another uh -huh. five years if I had watched uh, the Twilight Zone at the time when I discovered uh, Isaac Asimov. But it was a slower, it was a slower climb, I think. Yeah. Well, I think that uh, having dived into the, the deep end of Marvel Comics the way I did, actually helped me when I then, like a year or so later, jumped into Dune. So I, I read the novel Dune when I was 11, which when I look back on it, I'm kind of amazed. But And I have I still love Dune. I've reread it about six or seven times over my lifetime. But, um, but that was like, at 11, that was a very difficult novel to read. 
yeah. for me anyway. But um, so I, I wonder what kind of reader I would be without without comics, in fact. Um, so what do you what, then what happened? Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, I was just I was just to follow up on that. Do you think that the the vocabulary of comics, like the science vocabulary of comics, gave you that sort of access or entryway into the harder sci-fi or did it just make it something that you know had a picture associated with it whether or not the science was understood i mean i'm 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 curious as to what paved the way or what I, made it easier i think it's uh interpreting a strange text vocabulary is one aspect of it but there's also like being plunged into strangeness you know I just learned the term uh, Android, and now I'm learning about the antibodies and other things <laughs> inside the Android. Like uh, that taking in a lot of, because that's what I think the more complicated science fiction does, like Dune, it throws a lot of strangeness at you. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that's a thrill for some science fiction re readers to be plunged into the strangeness and then interpret it. Um, and I think the comic books were a nice way you're plunged. I was plunged into strangeness with comic books at first before I got used to them. Uh, but it, there were more clues, more context to figure it all out and more, um, you know, the colorful costumes and weird characters kept you going while you figured out what else was going on. Right. Right. Um, so in a way, I bet even Stan Lee helped me read Thomas Pynchon. <laughs> yeah. Because that's that's Thomas Pynchon's even more than Dune is a, often plunged into a strange, weird thing like like the novel V. I don't know if you've ever read that, but I still don't really think... know what that novel me meant. But. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you know, and I think I admire that at times, and then at other times I am a little resentful of being that adrift so there are so oh, i don't know if it's such an adriftness yeah yeah but but also i mean not not him only as a right i mean like a particular kind of and that's just my relation with it it's like if i'm completely adrift there's a nice thrill to it for a little while and i think that's why in a short story or a short film it has the maximum punch that i think of because yeah. you get sort of a taste of it and then you're left with this the longer the work goes I start looking for more and more purchase and which is where, you know, I find like really good science fiction gives it to you as right. you, you know, like you start well, off absolutely lost and then get more confident. Right. And that actually is the way I read comics. Now, when I'm complain about a comic, cause I, you know, unlike you, I'll, I'll talk about every comic I read, even if I didn't like it. So when I complain about a comic, it's often that, because in my mind, the comic is the best way to give a reader a purchase. Yes, you can take me to a really strange place, but then you, because you have words and pictures and you use them in these very clever ways, you can make me fully understand what's going on. And when a comic fails to do that, when it has the best tools for doing that, I feel particularly annoyed. Like, mm. like, let, let, a simple one is, say, uh, in a comic, one character has handed the magic MacGuffin to another character, but you're not sure which character was it, it was handed to. You have pictures. Right. You could have showed me exactly <laughs> which character handed it, but you didn't. You were lazy and you didn't bother to draw it clearly enough or something. Right. Or so, they wanted, but, unless, they, unless it was intentional, right? Unless they right. wanted it to be oh, obscure. Very true. But yeah. often you'll read later and you'll say, oh, they thought I knew that X had the magic MacGuffin. Right. But I don't. Um, well, I mean, but, but that comes so down overall, to care. But that, but that points out, the, that's my complaint, but really the strength of comics. And because I like the strangeness, but I do like the purchase, the the right. under, the grip on things. And, uh, and that's sometimes why I think comics are the best format, because you have so many different tools to work your way towards that understanding. I mean, movies obviously can do that too, but somehow <laughs> comics to me feel more multi-layered. I don't know why, but. Yeah, well, I mean, I would I would say that 
well, every medium is different and they all yes. have their strengths, yes. etc. You know, but we didn't start our channels on movies or <laughs> yes. video games, did we? <laughs> so right. uh, I, there's like silent agreement over there. But it is, I mean, I like prose and I... Mm -hmm. I do too. You know, I, I think it's incredibly... But I found myself bored of anything but the best prose has to mm -hmm. offer. And that's not yet the case with comics. I can, you know, I, I can think that, oh, this is the best. But even if something is not absolutely the best, I can still enjoy it. And it still seems specific and individual in a way that prose doesn't. It just seems like an imitation of the best things. It just seems like, well, uh -huh. there's a certain number of words and there's a certain number of ways you can do scenes and all that stuff. And you are cutting and pasting. So even the best things are cutting and pasting from something else. There's something about the comics medium, I agree with you, that it gives me purchase but more than purchase, it gives me individual specificity that I wouldn't get from mm -hmm. some other comic because it would have a different writer, it would have a different artist at a different time of life or a different combination. Right. It would, it's, it's very unique in that way. And that allows me to be not bored as fast or not right. find right. that, you know, it's old hat as quickly as I do with prose. I mean, if you've got good prose writing, you'll still hold my attention, but it has to be the best. Otherwise, I'd much rather be reading comics. Right, right. Well, I'm, my brain is going off in different directions, but in some way, that's why I prefer short fiction in prose, because you get mm -hmm. in and you get out. Um, often a lot of novels and certainly a lot of nonfiction feels padded out to me. But... Then I was thinking, I feel the same way about manga. It feels padded out to me. And I feel there's a drift towards doing things the way manga does in the English language comics now. And I feel like I'm reading more things that feel padded out. Uh, generally, the the use of the picture and the and the words together properly does sort of get you to the point more quickly, right? You can't pussyfoot or you can't spend... Uh, 10 pages padding out your story by uh, describing the scenery or something in a, in a comic book. That's a gross oversimplification about prose, but, um, and I don't really mean to attack manga, but I do. <laughs> people are, and yourself as one of them are in various ways, encouraging me to re try manga. And I think that often what I miss in manga or, or what I find missing is because my, my brain has decided that what makes comics great is this, you know, getting right down into it quickly, <laughs> that the efficiency of it. Well, I think, I mean, the problem the I, the, my problem is I don't know enough about manga uh -huh. to speak with any kind of authority, yeah. you know, on the different types. And, and I realize channels. I am generalizing based on a small sample. <laughs> right. But I think you, I, I think though, uh, you have a point about certain kinds of extremely long running series in multiple volumes and that can be used for you know that can be used as a shorthand manga can be used as a shorthand for that just than the way that comics can be used as a shorthand for big two marvel and dc or right Marvel, DC, Dark Horse, maybe or something like that. But, yeah. you know, when I think about all, all the controversial things and all the the groups that are arguing politics at different levels, they all <laughs> name themselves with the word comics in their title. Right. Uh, but they the usually just mean the Marvel comics or something. Exactly. Or some so, but, but, but that's all that really that means, at right. least the context of their conversation is like, okay, we're not talking about Reina Telgemeier and we're not talking about mm. Corto Maltese, you know, something like that. We're not talking about, we're talking about this. We're talking about Captain America and we're talking about, so, but, but manga, like, because I've read a lot of manga that is just single volume standalone story, mm -hmm. uh, because I'm just thinking about something that's written and drawn in Japan or created and published out right. of Japan by probably a Japanese, uh, but I, <clears throat> I agree with you. I think padded, and this is one of the issues that I have with the, the weekly, uh, commercial magazines that don't have any planned end as a long running series is that, mm -hmm. well, of course they're going to reboot and of course they're going to reinvent. And you know, why do people get so angry? Because what else are they supposed to do? It's supposed to be static. Whereas right. you could have 
long running series in comics, in American comics that are Love and Rockets or Usagi Ojimbo. I mean, these right. are also things that are running for multiple decades, uh, featuring a uniform, expansive set of characters, right. etc. But they have time, you know, so. Yeah. So the and issue at least is with that Usagi, when do I... he artfully ends every story. He yes. knows how to so... structure a story, give you what you need. Um, and it, that doesn't stop him from going on for decades, but you don't right. have to have an open-ended story that way. Right. Um, so I think sometimes it becomes about what type of storytelling are you interested in? You know, if someone's making a soap opera, then they're not thinking about a 10 episode Netflix show. If they're making right. a feature film, they're not thinking about a multi-season 23 episode sitcom on, you know, broadcast right. network, you know, so... So I think format and what you want to do makes a difference, but there are certain industries which lean more heavily in one area than any other. And that, mm -hmm. you know, I, I think that's interesting to, to observe. Yeah. I'm not saying manga should be what I want it to be. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying why I almost feel I have trouble, more trouble adjusting to manga than people think I will. Um, because, because I'm so interested in the, you know, the, the picture speaks a thousand words kind of thing that the ability to shoot the story into my brain or shoot the communication from the creator into my brain far more efficiently than any other medium for me, um, is comics. And, uh, right. Yeah, I mean, Usagi is a perfect example of something. It can go on for a long time, and that's great. But it's still panel by panel. It has that efficiency. It has that art artfulness of communication that I like. Yeah. And maybe that's... I have defined comics perhaps by a subset of comics in a way. Um, but. No, I, I, I know what you're talking about. And again, because I don't know much about it in detail, I feel a little because I get the impression that a lot of manga is created to be read on a weekly basis and it's created yes. on a really fast schedule and it's created in an almost disposable like you read it and you're done and you move on to the next thing. So right. it's in some and ways. And I think you read it on the train from what I'm told yeah, by my friends so... who've gone to Japan. Everyone's reading manga on the train. The speed at which you're reading it and how much you're absorbing is very different. It's yes. closer in some ways to being a flip book than being a Western mm -hmm. style panel by panel comic book where you're getting an impressionistic sense and you're getting things, you know, it's kind of like those TV shows where even if you look away for a minute, it's okay. <laughs> even if you go answer the phone, <laughs> right. you, haven't you go to the bathroom much. and you haven't missed because much. they're, 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 they're made to do their storytelling in a particular way. And that's the way I think certain comics are. Yeah. I, you know, and I, I, I've certainly felt that way about American superhero comics where I feel they're a little soap operatic where right. I will need to have certain key things happen in certain ways in order to keep the story being propagated. Right. But, but yeah, I, I, I think, I think as far as manga is concerned, sometimes people have a, a problem with art style or the depiction of humans and the, uh, do you have those kind the of eyes? Sometimes. Yeah. Does that, does that bother you? Like, because it's uh, not a, little bit, a style that you're there. There's plenty of, I've, as I've gone on, I've discovered because people recommend there's plenty of manga that doesn't have those particular problems. Um, a number of people recommended berserk to me. I don't know if you've, is it berserk yeah. or berserker? The creator recently Berserk. died. Yeah. And so I read the first paperback volume of it. And the the art had, an, to me, a, a interesting kind of, uh, what's what's the word? It, it, it was both crude but intense. But the problem was this, I felt like I read 250 pages and I got about 10 pages of story. Um, so I was like, this was interesting, but I don't know if I want to spend my time reading so many volumes to get that much story. Um, and maybe right. the pace picked up. But I also think, well, you know, when I said we'll talk about our development as readers, I was thinking about mine and comic books along the way have taught me how to read the next set of comics. 
-hmm. So after Marvel Comics, my next thing was The Spirit, which beautifully tells a complete story in seven pages. And that became kind of my ideal. Um, got, usually I don't have tape on a bag, but I'm going to open it up. So I was so used to, um, I sort of made that my ideal, that kind of compact story that, where every panel and every page matters. And so that's that still sort of informs me as a reader, mm -hmm. and may you know may also be why I like um, why I like short fiction and prose more than novels. Too. Yeah, I know you're a spirit fan, which is why I uh, yes, so I, I I love the spirit, and I you know, and I I'm I'm not a you know like oh I was I love the spirit before people talked about it. not at all I'm <laughs> definitely a late comer to the spirit people talked about the spirit and I was just like how good can it be you know it looks a little cheesy it, I'm sure it's dated and so right. therefore it was one of those things where it has a place in history and I'll appreciate right. that for what it is but I don't need in the 21st century to be reading this or something like that but <laughs> when I read it I was just like this is this is terrific stuff you know and this is I think I mean there are obviously problematic elements to it but not as Definitely. many as you would think there would be uh, I mean for the time <laughs> that it was done and compared to a lot of what else was being published at that time it is surprisingly modern but yes the comic storytelling in it I mean and I was reading it as not as a sophisticated or something but like not as a neophyte comics reader right so it wasn't like i was looking at the spirit having not seen comics i've seen right. comics that have come after it and it was still so smart and still so fresh and so interesting um yeah that i was that i was instantly a fan yeah so this i discovered the spirit by accident when i was 14 and that sort of gave me a window beyond the Marvel and came at a good time at age 14 mm. when you're getting a little more pretentious or what have you. <laughs> and then it took a while to find other stuff that, you know, followed on from the spirit. But I think the underground comics and, and then things like um, love and rockets and just all kinds of comics really sprout out of whether consciously or not out of the, the idea of taking it very seriously as storytelling, I think. And, yeah. and using all your all your possible tools, um, there's no stinting in the in the spirit. There was unlike the most comics of the '40s. There was no, uh, you know, hurry hurry up and just draw the panel any way you can and turn right. this out to be thrown away. It was it was drawn to be lasting literature of a sort, in yeah. my mind, anyway. Yeah, absolutely. But, and I think the I, and you were reading these. In, in in the case of those other comics you mentioned, of course, like Love and Rockets, you were reading these as they were coming out, you know, as they were seeing the light of day for the first time. And so therefore, yes, because the changes in you yeah. in a reader were actually mirroring the changes in in comics. Yeah, well, not the, uh, the spirit was being reprinted well, yeah. from the 40s. And right. Uh, yeah. No, um, but I meant. But then, yes. And, and, you know, whereas perhaps something had economically collapsed for for publishing or book selling uh, in India, in starting around 1980, the comic book shops started popping up. And so that became my source for, you know, I got uh, Love and Rockets and um, uh, very important to me was Warrior Magazine from England, which had the mm -hmm. first Alan Moore stuff I encountered. Um, wow. And each time I would read some, you know, I would get to the spirit then to, uh, Daredevil and then to Alan Moore's early work or early ish. I mean, there was some even earlier stuff I didn't see. It would change my brain a little bit, I think, in terms of how I read comics. And you can't go back in a way. I mean, you can go yeah. nostalgically back, but then your brain is looking for more like that or possibly something new that will change your brain again. Um, yeah. It gets harder to find, <laughs> I guess, as you get older. Well, I mean, this is what I was going to think. But that, YouTube course, has helped me a you lot. Get... Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, the internet in general, you know, we can we can be those old guys to talk about. I remember when there wasn't an internet and you couldn't find out anything. But, but... maybe this will change my brain next. Oh, there you I go. I haven't read it yet. <laughs> All right. But, but this is your I influence mean, here. <laughs> 
Yes, it's it's and it's it's a very thin book. So you know, yeah. I I always worry because I praise it so highly, and then I wonder if I've put too much on it to bear. You know, because it's something so right. light and something so fragile almost. But I'd I'd love to know what you think of it. Um, but I was I was I was thinking that yes, as you get more and more refined, as your expectations become more informed because of what you've read it does become harder and i think that's kind of what i was talking about with me and prose where mm -hmm. it, it, it's gotten to the the level of stimulation that you need is very high or maybe it's like a junkie you know you need higher and right. higher doses but but have you ever found yourself returning to something maybe out of nostalgia etc and then finding out that it really passes muster as far as your current refined status is concerned yes yes yeah um well, it happens frequently. I mean, it also frequently happens that something is way worse than you thought it was. <laughs> well, <laughs> but, yeah. um, I just recently. Well, I mean, the, I, the way worse you would, the way worse you'd kind of expect it. You know, I've become more sophisticated yes, and all yes. of that kind of stuff. So of course it'll drop in quality. You know, I'm yeah. I'm, I'm intrigued about the one that matches up. Well, uh, the first thing that pops to my mind a few months ago, I reread uh, Warlock. It was actually. Marvel premiere featuring Warlock, but it was the first story where the character him became Warlock. I don't know if you're familiar with the Warlock that then became famous when Jim Starlin did it. Um, yeah, I've only yeah I've only seen glimpses. I've never read okay. any Warlock, but I've seen that. I think issue one had a very famous cover with. Was it a yellow cover, or am I, maybe I'm thinking of something else? Is I it wish a... I had it nearby, but uh, right. Okay. Anyway. Anyway, it's written by Roy Thomas and drawn by Gil Kane, and I, I mean, it's just an it's just a setup for the story they were hoping to do afterwards, which eventually gets taken over by other creators. But I just thought, wow, this one issue is just brilliant art. It's like I don't know how familiar you are with Gil Kane, but it was like some of the best. Gil Kane art I'd ever seen and it was just masterful how he was visually telling the story and and Roy Thomas is uh he loves to uh re refine the world of superheroes I think that's mm -hmm. his biggest skill and it was it was him taking all this stuff Stan Lee had done and refining it into something new and it was just kind of a a brilliant little thing to uh to enjoy and I remember liking the last time I read that issue, I was 11, I think. <laughs> and I remember liking it, but I was expecting, I was expecting to think, oh, well, this is a lot crappier than I remember. But right, in fact, right. it was extremely, extremely well done. Um, wow. I think in the, in the churn of, well, probably of every age of comics, but in the churn of the Bronze Age comics at, at Marvel, there was a lot of innovation and a lot of crap and you just don't know which is which it was all coming out so fast but you know that that seemed like an issue where those two creators were having a little mini peak to me right um, how about you I, do you have that experience with uh childhood comics or yeah you know it's it's always interesting um because i take it as a sign of how smart i was as a child <laughs> you know just like uh -huh. even at that yeah. age i recognize the brilliance <laughs> of this yeah which is which is the approach but i was i think i was very surprised when i revisited some of the disney comics from my childhood mm -hmm. and realized that you know because in all of these because i'm talking about the carl bach stories and i'd right. been i was just you know ask and i had talking carl read Bach. i was i had read mm -hmm. carl bach stories all my life as a child and the Disney comics that I read were very similar to the Archie comics that I read, that they were often in anthology form where you'd have a new story and a reprint of an old story sort of mixed together. Or if you bought issue number 16, it would be something from a different period than issue number 17, at least in those local Indian reprints. So you never knew which era or which storyline you were going. And uh -huh. this is particularly interesting in the Archie comics where you would go from like the 50s to the 80s. Uh, uh, so and, they would look you know, quite different, but you didn't know in advance. Yeah, exactly. Each story would look quite different. And 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 all the backups would look different from the... And we weren't looking at the original comics. So the idea was, in most cases with comics, I do research later to find out what the rep... You know, like what you're talking about. Uh, Love and Rockets, I found out later about, you know, Alan Moore's stuff, I found out later about because it's just 
So then I imagine how it would have been. But with Karl Box, it actually happened that I was exactly in the way that whatever Karl Box's reputation as the good duck artist is right. as a child with no um with no uh credits in any mm -hmm. of these Disney comics. I was like, that that story was great. And that story uh -huh. was great. And they're all Karl Box stories. It's like I so recognized the good duck artist. You were having the same experience that the older fans of the Good Duck Artist yes, had. Yes, exactly. That is something that I later discovered that I had that same experience, you know, because because I could tell which stories were working for me. Mm -hmm. And then when I later discovered them or when I later returned to them, I was like, yep, all of these ones that were my childhood favorites are by Karl Box because they're in Karl Box anthologies <laughs> and collections and stuff like that right now. But yeah, I, I I was very impressed with how well those stories held up. I had I so I mean I was kind of lucky with the um the advent of comic book shops being as I was growing up. Yeah. But I had none of that. I did not get the Tintin and the Asterix. I did not even get the Carl Barks. Wow. There was pretty much no Donald Duck comics or Disney comics in my in my world when I was a kid. And so I think I first saw a few reprints of them in uh, comic book shops in my twenties. Uh, there were like, right. I think it was Gladstone or someone would do right, right. very yeah. thin trades. And so I would read random bits of Karl Barks. Um, and I thought, oh, that's pretty good. And then I'd never really read a lot of Karl Barks and I'm still working on it through some uh, Fantagraphics books. Yeah, and I'm not. I'm not I sure mean, what I think about them. <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to ask you. I was like, I want to know what you think about them because I I can completely understand it being colored by nostalgia, but I'm just so convinced that it's not just nostalgia. You know, I'm I. What, but what do you think? You're reading them for the first time as an adult, you know. But it's still it's very random, and I don't know if I've hit the ones that would you know, cl click my in my brain and make me a, a huge Carl Barks fan. But I think they're good, but I guess I don't, I feel guilty. I don't see them as, they don't yeah. obviously feel like masterpieces to me or something. Um, right. But right. again, I just, I have like three random volumes from Fantagraphics and I'm told that those are kind of not in order. Yeah. Um, and I'm not sure what the thinking with, with them is. Uh, so, like I've read, uh, trying to remember, most recently it was like uh, Uncle Scrooge and Gyro Gearloose end up on another uh, planet. And uh, for 24 Carat Moon? I can't remember. And, and my shelves are just a bit too much out of reach. But um, I was like charmed, charmed by it. And then I started to get a little bored. <laughs> it's like a. I could yeah. see that that Carl Barks had a a joke he was mining and then he was mining it again and again. That's how it felt. <laughs> yeah. So it I, might have been a lesser Carl Barks story. Um, so I, anyway, I feel like I'm disappointing all the Carl Barks fans. No, no, no. I think I think I and I think this is the interesting thing about these conversations is because there are certain things in which things just get accepted as the truth. And it's just like, mm -hmm. this is, you know, this person is God. But then I've heard that about every person, you know? I mean, it yeah. doesn't matter. You know, I've heard that about Rob Liefeld. I've heard that about Jim Lee. I mean, like, it doesn't matter. It's like, there will be devotion and they'll be like, this is a master unlike any other. And then there'll be people who are like, this is stupid. You know, this person is way overrated. And then there'll be people right. in the middle who are just kind of lukewarm and they're like, that's fine. You know, I'm not that invested one way or the other. So I think it's, I don't think there are any absolute, the reasons why I like Karl Box or why I think Karl Box is great will be very different. I think from the reasons, I don't think you and I will be disagreeing on the same thing. You're looking at a different right. thing and I'm looking at a different thing is usually the way it is most of the time. I think it's very rare that you will think, this piece of dialogue is atrocious. And I will think this piece of exact same piece of dialogue is wonderful. <laughs> you know, it's not really that, that we, that we would right. disagree on, I think. Or my comic reading brain has not yet been taught to read Karl Barks just right. A, a, a example that somehow keys in with me, I mean, because they're such similar cartoonists is uh, Julie Doucet, who, mm -hmm. um, 
I'm assuming you're familiar with her, but I have to yes. confess I was not familiar with her. At least I did not remember her name until she won the Angelam Award, right. which could okay. be considered the biggest comic book award in, yeah. in the Western world, <laughs> in the in the uh, European English sl sl European slash English world of uh, comics. And so I went and grabbed another book of hers called New York Stories, and I wasn't that impressed. Like I thought, mm. oh, okay, this is not bad, uh, but it's it's kind of so-so autobiography, I thought, with really cool art. And then right. I also got this thing called My Most Secret Desire, which collects all her stories based on her dreams, mm -hmm. and I loved it. <laughs> and so now maybe Julie Doucette has rewired my brain and maybe I can read other Julie Doucette and appreciate it. Or maybe not. Maybe I will only love this particular volume. Yeah. But, and I um, think that volume is very different from like, I know that you you're not the biggest fan of autobiographical comics. And... I'm very I'm, I'm dubious about autobiographical <laughs> and, comics to some and, degree. And, and heaven forbid they be independent <laughs> black and white autobiographical comics. No, no, I'm fine with that part. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, like a, a, a color comic from Scholastic about braces <laughs> is not what you're talking about when you object oh, to oh, autobiography. Right, right, yeah. No, no. Yeah. We're, we're talking about, uh, you know, the uh, I was going to say that the children of Harvey Picar, but I guess he was not the first. I used to think he was the first one to do it, but um... yeah, I mean, I like Harvey Picar the most, perhaps, of any of of the people. But I, I do. Uh, who 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 came before Harvey Picar in that purely? I mean, I guess Crumb to a certain extent. But, yeah, but but even earlier, I don't. There, there's a guy who just died. Is his name Justin Green or something? And they're now saying he was the first autobiographical right. comic. Right. Okay. But I have not read that. So I, uh, it's something Binky Brown in the title. Okay. Um, okay. I, that sounds vaguely familiar. Yeah. I mean, I'm never sure about chronology or what was the first. Right. You know, and even when people say what's the first graphic novel or the first comic, yeah. it's like the first isn't as interesting as in the what we consider the first is probably the most memorable or the one that had the mm -hmm. most sales or people talked about the most or, you know, reached a particular kind of critical mass and consciousness. And I don't think even American Splendor did that outside of the comics. It's sort of like your favorite band's favorite band type of right. thing, you know, outside of the comics creators world, probably until the movie with Paul Giamatti. Right. And, so, you know. Yeah. So for me, he was the first like pure right. autobiography Crumb mm -hmm. would throw himself occasionally into things, but it was really later on that he and his wife started doing purely autobiographical comics, right. I think. Mm -hmm. um, but what, what was I going to say? Oh, and I really liked him. So I maybe came in with issue three or something. That might be when it started showing up in my comic book shops. And I really liked him early on. And it, I've decided that he jumped the shark for me when he went on David Letterman. And then did a whole issue where he just recreated his appearance on David Letterman as a comic, right? And and uh, and and after that, I just sort of started losing interest in him. Oh, and there, I have, uh, and, and maybe I haven't given it a fair chance because I probably bought a few issues after that and then stopped. And and he's produced a large body of work since since that period. Um, and what I think I liked about him was the short snippets of everyday life. Yeah. And um, I don't know. Julie Doucette could do that, I think. And the New York stories maybe would have been better if they were just, if I'd encountered each one as a short snippet rather than as a continuous apparent graphic novel. Um, right. But uh, I'm trying to think. I feel like there's a number of autobiographical comics that you have talked about in some of your videos, but I'm now drawing a blank. Well, I mean, I mean, yes, autobiography, I think, is something that comics is, I think comics is such a, like on one level, it's a collaborative thing. And I think that's mm -hmm. where a lot of the American, like, you know, every month is an issue that means you've got right. to have a team of people. The it's, industrial have, model. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, but you've got to have a penciler and an inker, you know, it's, right. it's double work to do the penciling and the inking yourself or unless you, 
and you've got to have a letterer and you've got to do color separations and things like that. So that works a particular way and it creates this sort of collaborative, it's like a mini movie set or, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's a little more factory linear, but yes. But it also has that capacity to be extremely personal with a writer artist and the right. writer artist part of it has, has fascinated me in comics, you know, because I love collaborations and I love like mixing and matching creators. And it's right. almost a different type of pleasure than seeing that writer artist have that unique expression. So I don't know how to draw a nose is like, that's just the thing. When you do your writing and art, your characters are going to look this way and they start creating their own vocabulary rather than fidelity to form and things like that. So that's why I like autobiographical comics because it seems a natural extension of that level of individuality, warts and all, if that makes sense. This artist never draws noses on his strange characters. You just said, I don't know how to draw a nose in this book happened to be next. Well, I don't that's know taking it to the ridiculous extreme, but... Oh, this is your Kankor. Um... Kankor, yeah. I just got it in the mail a few days ago. I've been working my way through it. It's a... It's a very... So you're talking about... I love the unique vision, too. But say, for instance, with Robert Crumb, I liked well. it better when he made up characters that reflected parts of himself than when he just writes a story about what me and my wife had for lunch today. I'm, I'm being <laughs> severe there, but his later yeah. work that is just him and his wife, to me, it's not nearly as stimulating as when he filtered himself through a bit of fiction, if that makes right. sense. Yeah. So that, no, and that's, no, a personal, that's a personal taste. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with- I mean, I with... agree with you too. I mean, even his older stuff, because I haven't read a lot of stuff that he has done with Eileen. I mean, I've seen things in anthologies and stuff like mm -hmm. that. But even his earlier stuff, the confessional stuff, it's, I understand that it's supposed to create this kind of discomfort or friction, but it's never been something that I've really enjoyed. I've enjoyed his more loopy out there stuff because I can at least dismiss it in a way right. that I find difficult to do with the content of what he's saying, particularly yeah. his, you know, more race related and sexuality related stuff which is extremely disconcerting but i mean yeah. that just happens to be with the content of what he's saying i admire the fact that he wants to put a mirror up to these things and put them on display and as an exercise you know i understand that is a piece of like say performance art but right. it doesn't mean that i want to go to that show but uh, <laughs> but 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 there are so many uh, people who do autobiography in a way that makes me feel you know, connected to them as their interior uh -huh. life, which I think is an amazing thing for, for, for literature to do. And I think with prose autobiographies, I've never quite gotten that. I mean, even with the best prose autobiography, there is a, there's a form of reverence that I have for what's being written. And even when they're talking about something raw, I'll be like, wow, look at how great they are at, at how they're describing mm -hmm. this in prose. So there's that distance that I found comics autobiography to like put me right next to them. So even if I'm judging them harshly, it's a much more direct connection that I have. I, I don't know why, but there's something about, yeah. and that and that autobiography that is both written and drawn by the same person. I mean, specifically. Right, right. Yeah, which Harvey Picard did not do. Um, right. And that was probably a weakness of his work. Um, I mean, it's interesting because because of that, the thing that you have, like you can now make Harvey P. Carr into Superman or, you know, you can say which era, Harvey, which artist are you talking <laughs> right. about too? You know, so I think that adds a new, I, I think doing it with someone else doing it might feel, but because Harvey P. Carr is the person who's done it most and so for such a long period of time, it creates this inter, I don't know, you know, so like he, he made a comic saying comics can't, Comics aren't only about superheroes and right. human beings, normal human beings can be superheroes. And then there's that one aspect of superheroes that he adds to the fact that he's in a comic is that he looks different depending on which <laughs> artist is drawing him, you know, which I've always right. really thought was a cool part of America's Splendor. True. Um, well, so 
I haven't maybe read enough autobiographical comics, but I actually have enjoyed prose memoirs better, especially really? back in it's it, before the memoir form became sort of a hot bestseller. A lot of authors would disguise their autobiography as a autobiographical novel, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And I felt a lot of those were very good. Um, right. Uh, and I, so maybe I, I can't, I shouldn't judge, but I do judge <laughs> anyway, from what I've read in autobiographical comics, it feels like a lot of artists feel like it's just, or the cartoonists just enough to put out something that happened and not filter it enough through enough, uh, self-awareness and artistic vision. And I might mm -hmm. be wrong, but I sort of, I, for instance, I, uh, what's, um, I'm forgetting the name of Chester Brown's other book, well-known book that I just read. Paying uh, for it? No, I did read Paying for it. And Paying for it was probably the, the beginning of the end of my worship of Chester Brown. Um, <laughs> I went back, You, I Never Liked You, is that what it's called? All right, I, yeah. I, I recently reread I Never Liked You, which I had read in the 90s. And mm -hmm. uh and I maybe my perspective as an older man or something, I just felt he he's he backs off of his material too much. And I really felt that in paying for it, where he sort of as you get towards the end of paying for it, he sort of backs off of what was really going on here and, and what is really my relationship with these prostitutes and that, that kind of thing. Hmm. And, it, and so when I reread re uh, I Never Really Liked You, there was a period where we get something of his interior life and then it goes away. Right. And uh, it just seemed like it just seemed like there's prose memoirs I've read that just do a much better job of exploring what's really going on, if you will. Interesting. But again, yeah. I'm not I've, I've not since I don't love autobiographical comics i'm not reading a lot of them so <laughs> no no i i understand what you mean of course i mean i think prose novels have the interiority part in their advantage you know it's as sort of as, built in for most writers yeah. Yeah. yeah and that's the way and that's the way prose connects with us so that's why prose can have first person narration straight into you the reader that is the least obtrusive you know, and then when you get it in a movie, it sounds ponderous. And if you have it in a video game, you know, you, you can see the strings <laughs> in right. every other medium with narration in a way that you don't call it narration. You just say it's first person or you say it's third person. Right. It's, exactly. it's it's a different it's a different delivery system. Very and so point. therefore, the psychological interiority part of it will always be its forte as far as explicitness is concerned is 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 the way it seems to me. Uh, but the marriage of that to the situation, you know, it, it's kind of like Chris Ware. <laughs> like, why does mm -hmm. Chris Ware feel so claustrophobic? Or why does Chris Ware feel so despondent? It's not because he's giving you thought balloons. In fact, he's quite mm -hmm. conservative. But you never have any right. absence of what the scene is supposed to make you feel as a reader, even if you're not... 100% sure, but I think you're also sure of what the character is feeling. But even if you're not sure <laughs> yes. of what the character is feeling, you are 100% sure what you are feeling and you're meant to feel it. So the, so I think just, I mean, all I'm saying is I think the intentionality of what the comics medium tries to evoke. And I think what it's best at is marrying those glimpses to a certain kind of setting where because of the way the panel looks and because of how small someone is and how far that other person is who's walked away from them, that's a different kind of thing than, you know, and it's been a while since I read I Never Liked You. And I think I read that back to back with the Playboy because they were the two um, Chester Brown books I hadn't yet read. And uh -huh. they felt definitely to me to be more younger works and they, mm -hmm. they seem to be from a different time. But it was like, it was interesting because he seemed to be saying, you, I mean, I don't know, you could kind of feel like punching the character, you know, you could yes, kind of think yeah. that, you know, you, you, you deserve to be slapped, but 
that's okay because I think I've read a lot of literature in which I felt like I want to slap the lead character. And I think those are pretty good novels and those are pretty good movies and stuff like that. I think that it depends on what he's, I don't think he was trying to get us to be sympathetic to him. I don't think he was trying to get us to be, you know, in his corner at a particular kind of, he was trying to present something. And I think wanting to slap him is kind of an intended result of what he wanted the reader to feel. And that is what made it, successful to me as a work if that makes any sense uh-huh no it does make sense i have to say that you score a big point for autobiography with bringing up chris ware because <laughs> he really does use the form in brilliant masterful ways now is he autobiography or is he mm -hmm. autobiographical fiction or even right. further removed from that but right he he is a master at um at using the form to to give us so much. Um, now, <laughs> I I had to review three comics for a newspaper once, uh, and I had a short deadline. And one of them was um, what's Chris Ware's most famous book from uh, um, Jimmy Corrigan. Back Jimmy. In the one day. of them was Jimmy Corrigan, like the collected Jimmy Corrigan, and I had to read it all very quickly. <laughs> I was so depressed by it. <laughs> that I've never read any more Jimmy, uh, any more uh, uh, Chris, Ware. Chris Ware. But I, I've been wanting to try Rusty Brown, actually. So I might yeah. get that. I mean, I think Rusty Brown building stories, you really can't go wrong yeah. with either of I'm, those I, two. I've looked at them. They're, I mean, he's a, he's a genius. I mean, I'm not at all against Chris Ware in terms of his reputation. I just was so depressed by that book. <laughs> no, I can understand. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, one a person who occurred to me way back when we were talking about science fiction and being dropped in, you know, of that that unknowing kind of thing, yeah. um, is Brandon Graham, who I, creates that sense of mystery and like yes. what is going on, and and like I am adrift, but I'm absolutely enthralled. I feel the same way. Yeah, he's he's definitely an uh, a singular creator who I'm really keeping an eye out for everything he does next. Um, I don't and know. It's if, amazing. Is, has his most recent book made its way towards you yet? Um, the, no, Rain um, Like Hammers is the Rain last like one. Hammers. Yeah. yeah, you you don't have that one yet. No, no, that's that. I I did. I, yeah. I oh, it has. That that's after, what I meant. After has all it, the yeah, yeah. Has okay, it made yeah, it that one library. that one has. Yeah, it's just uh, uh, there's something about you know, and that's why I I never want to boil down what comics are to any one thing because anytime sure. you think you've got it figured out uh, you know there'll be something else but but his work is the closest I've come to that sort of childhood reading of science fiction where everything was new mm -hmm. and everything was wondrous and everything right. was scary but you, it, like because most of the time you don't understand why someone would go towards the dangerous thing it never right. makes any sense in movies and stuff like that but when you read comics like that, you get it. You're like, yeah, yes. I can, I can completely understand where, where the allure of something that is probably dangerous for you comes from because you've got to create it in this way. Well, the the comics that try to be mysterious and annoy me, I would love to force <laughs> them to read Brandon Graham. This is how you do it, so right. that your reader doesn't feel cheated. <laughs> because ultimately, which, I mean, which... sure some readers do, but I don't anyway. When I read Brandon Graham. Right. Eventually, I can parse out what he was up to, and it's all there. You know, it's somewhere on the page, in my mind, anyway. Which which comics are you referring to when you say the ones who try to be <laughs> uh, mysterious and fail? I'm very curious to know. <laughs> well, uh, a recent example would be um, the Me You Love in the Dark. Okay. It just I think I saw uh, this in one of your from weekly comics. Okay. And it, it was about a artist in a haunted house who has some kind of affair with the poltergeist that lives in the house or something <laughs> right. or something. Cause I'm not sure I read the whole comic, uh, you know, the five issues and I was never quite sure if there was one or two ghosts even, <laughs> <laughs> but that's, that's tough. So, um, and, and that's by Scotty Young and a very good artist um, whose name is, Hor ah, I forgot his name. But anyway. Well, Scotty Young's writing it. He's the writer and he has another artist who he's teamed up with on a number of books. 
and okay. they're very they've done very good work together but in that particular comic they were too clever for me or something <laughs> <laughs> so you know what we've we've talked for quite a while now and i uh, you of course don't ever need sleep but i need to get <laughs> my daylight hours now i'm joking about not i know sleep. it's 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 sunday and you're here you know sitting and talking to <laughs> this guy at 1 a.m. in the morning huddled in his <laughs> bookshelves. Yeah, well, luckily you don't need to work tomorrow, so I'm glad of that. Yes, tomorrow is a day off for um, Independence Day here in India. Oh, oh very nice. Independence Day, so. And that would so be... So I'll, I'll, I'll get to sleep in a little bit, but... Sorry, I interrupted you. I was just asking for a little uh, Indian history. Independence Day happened... In what year? August fifteenth, nineteen forty-seven. Forty-seven. So after World yes. War Two. Okay. Yes. I wasn't sure so, if it was so, before or after. Right. So a lot of the, uh, I mean, I mean, I mean, there the were resistance movements and things like that throughout, but the real yes. groundswell and mass thing started in nineteen forty-two, and mm -hmm. uh, after the Second World War, it it was just a matter of time. It wasn't, right. It wasn't going to take very long after that, it seems. But yes. So nineteen forty-seven. Um, so young country in many ways yes, and ancient yes. country in many other ways. Well, and that's that's an interesting thing to explore. Have you, I was going to stop right now, but have you <laughs> read um, Ram V's Graffiti's Wall? Yes. Okay. And does that yes, feel I, like India to you? Because that's one of the few books about life in India that I've read. See, I don't think Graffiti's Wall is trying to be a documentary. And well, true. It's, yeah. it's, it's extremely stylized, but I think it's it's working off of a, a, a metaphor. So I think it's as informed by pop culture and mm -hmm. television and movies as it is and comic books as right. it is by, you know, so it's it's not realistic, but I yeah. enjoy it. Uh, you know, it's it's I would think of it almost as if it was very, very low sci-fi cyberpunk uh, not <laughs> quite you know it's not it's not it's not a vision uh -huh. of the streets per se uh, but it's not sci-fi obviously yes. but the way that it's done and the storytelling stuff that it wants to do is extremely stylized and i actually like i i appreciate that more than a pseudo documentary or uh, a, approach some of <laughs> which i've seen that 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 i find to be quite weird yeah well, I mean, when you just said, I'm not that it, he captures that at all, but I, I was just thinking uh, a, a country that is both new and extremely ancient is a very interesting setting. And, and maybe there's other comics that uh, explore that. But um, I was, you know, yeah, I think at least from be... my uh, my being in a country <laughs> where everything's new. You know, right. Especially because well, I live on the w West Coast. Uh, oh, so even newer as as even as, newer. as manifest so I, I destiny started on the was East fulfilled. Coast and moved to the West Coast, and I'm like, boy, these people just put up buildings here because that was the fastest, easiest thing to slap together. <laughs> right, right. But uh, but yes, I think it, it, there's also political stuff, you know, right. and we obviously don't need to get into all of that. But the yeah. idea of national identity and mm -hmm. nationalism or nation building and all of these things, I think these are extremely interesting topics uh, these days yeah. in the world, um, given what we are seeing in a number of different places. So I would love to see stories explore the kind of friction that we see. Well, I mean, I don't know. M many people want fantasy and stuff like that, but I, yeah. I definitely think that the kind of thing that we are talking about is how old is a country and what do we mean by that, you know, identity. Right. You know, if you say right. 200 years or if you say yeah. 65 years or whatever, it's like, what do we mean by that? And I think that uh, in India right now, at least, it's an interesting time for those conversations because there's a lot of opposing views on mm -hmm. what culture what and identity, identity are about. Yeah. 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 That's, yeah, that could be. Uh, now that I think about it, like in novels, I've only uh, occasionally read novels set in India. They were never written by Indians. Hmm. Like, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with The River of Gods by Ian MacDonald. That was a very good science fiction novel. But okay. I have no, no idea if his, his vision of India 50 years from now <laughs> makes any sense. 
I, uh-huh. I I haven't read it, but I'll um, you know I'll take a look. I mean, it's He's a British to always say, right? Well, I mean, there, there, there are a lot of British novels about India. Yes, sure. yes, it's they like, think they know India, I suppose. <laughs> no, but also, you know, there's there, there's a formula for the book uh, nomination that I was watching some uh, stand-up comedian. It's like write a big fat book about India. You know, that's how you get right. on the short list or something like that. But uh, but it's it's always difficult to recommend things to represent a country you know yes. just like you know, what, it's a big you know, country too yeah yeah but even you know it was like the united states it's like i try to think about what would represent the united states and it's just like mm-hmm. no one thing you'd, you'd kind of want to put together a little hamper you right. know and you, you start with this and get to this and when you're feeling down watch this and when you're feeling angry right. watch this it's that kind of thing but uh yeah i think uh I don't know. I it, it's difficult, you know. And I I think yes. I think this yeah. conversation is over. But maybe we should have a second conversation about yes. how we see uh, things in movies and comics being portrayed as far as these kind of questions are concerned, mm-hmm. as far as yeah. identity or identity politics. Um, well, but... thank you very much for joining me, and uh, hopefully everyone's already subscribed to For the Love of Comics. But obviously, it, there will be a link down below. And um, and hopefully I will drag Angshiman out to uh, chat some more. No, this was a great pleasure. I'd love to. I'd love to chat some more. And uh, thank you so much. I've, you know, I didn't get to say this in the beginning of the video, but I've enjoyed your channel for so long. And I think you know when I first started looking at some of your videos, I didn't want to leave any comments because I found you know like everyone knows each other so i was kind of just like (laughs) watching videos and kind of hanging out so i think uh because i followed your uh comments from i think maybe earl gray's videos or uh, Mm -hmm. one of gold vidal's videos it was just some comment and i i followed that and found the channel and then then one day when you had commented on one of my videos i was like okay now i can now i have license (laughs) to comment on their on their videos you know now i won't feel like an outsider in that way so i was i was very very thrilled uh when that happened so i it's it's you know it's a fantastic channel and as i was saying a great view for me into this you know other reading experience and how things are done and and you've always answered so many questions for me that i have about (laughs) american comics and american things that I think it would be, yeah, it would be great to keep having these conversations. Awesome. Well, I look forward to more then. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you so much. Bye.